So we bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much once again for the privilege of being here. We're hungering and thirsting for your word. We want to know what your will is. And as we study this awesome subject, the Antichrist and the number 666, we especially ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We ask for divine guidance and wisdom. And give us tender hearts to receive what you have for us. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin by reviewing Revelation chapter 12, which was our subject of study in our last lecture. And basically this chapter is foundational for the lecture tonight and the lecture for tomorrow night. Because Revelation chapter 12 shows the different stages of the controversy between Christ and Satan and it shows that the culprit behind the scenes is the devil. In other words, Revelation 12 connects with Genesis 3.15. Now, in the subject that we're going to study tonight, which is Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation 13, the connection is not as obvious because uh, Rev, uh, Genesis 3.15 is not mentioned in connection with these prophecies. But with the background of Revelation chapter 12, you see that uh, Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 are to be understood within the context of Revelation 12 because they follow the same order of events, the same sequence. Now I'm going to go quickly through Revelation chapter 12 and review what we studied in our last lecture. We find there a woman who is with child. She's pregnant. When John sees her, she, the child has not been born yet, right? Which means that this represents the church in which period? In the Old Testament period before Jesus is born. But then we notice that the child is born and what power is ruling at that time? The Rome, yes, but what is it called? The dragon. The dragon stood next to the woman to devour her child as soon as the child was born. And so you go from the Old Testament, the woman being pregnant, the child not born yet, and you move on to the dragon who wants to devour the child as soon as the child is born. The child is born, but he is protected by God. And of course this child is none less than Jesus. Now how many horns did that dragon beast have? The dragon beast had ten horns and we're going to notice in our study today that those ten horns were not always on the head of the dragon. We're going to find that the dragon ruled for a while by himself and later on in the period of dom dominion of the dragon the ten horns sprouted out after the kingdom had governed for a while. And then you remember that you have a period of 1260 days also called time, times and the dividing of time in which the woman has to flee to the wilderness and who wants to devour the woman? Once again, who? The dragon. Who's behind all of these events? The dragon. In fact he's called that ancient serpent, the dragon and Satan. That's the connection with Genesis 3 verse 15. In other words, behind all of these earthly kingdoms and powers is whom? the ancient serpent of the Garden of Eden, the devil and Satan. And so you have 1260 years when the dragon or the serpent is persecuting the woman, but the woman flees to the wilderness and she's preserved by God in the midst of the persecution. And then something comes to the rescue of the woman. What came to the rescue of the woman? The earth helped the woman who was being persecuted. And how did the earth help the woman? by swallowing up the waters of persecution that the serpent spewed out of his mouth. And the waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. In other words, the earth stops persecution. Is the dragon happy about this? No! Because in the very last verse of chapter 12 it says, Then the dragon was wroth or was angry with the woman after the earth helps the woman. The dragon is angry with the woman. 
and goes to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who is behind these three principal stages of Revelation 12? It is the dragon or the ancient serpent. First he wants to kill the child, secondly he persecutes the woman in the wilderness for 1260 years, and lastly he persecutes the last remnant of God who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we've moved from the Old Testament to Rome, to the ten kingdoms which are the divisions of Rome, to the 1260 years of persecution, to a period of uh, when persecution comes to an end, at least for a while, and then to the final persecution of God's people at the very end of time. Now we need to compare with this Daniel chapter 2. Let's follow the sequence of Daniel chapter 2, and you don't even have to look up the chapter because this is just review. In Daniel chapter 2 you have a great image. The head of the image is made of what? Gold. The breast and arms of silver are composed of? silver. The belly is made of bronze. By the way, are all of these Old Testament kingdoms? Are Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece Old Testament kingdoms? Yes they are. And then you have a fourth beast. What is this, uh, or, or a fourth power represented by the legs of the image? What were the legs composed of? They were composed of iron. What kingdom is represented by the legs of iron? It is Rome, because you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So does Daniel 2 also begin in the Old Testament like Revelation 12? Yes it does. Revelation 12, after speaking about the woman being in travail, she has the child, the dragon wants to kill the child. Let me ask you, in Daniel chapter 2, which is the kingdom that actually was governing the world when Jesus was born? It was the legs of what? of iron. In other words the legs of iron are the same as what? Are the same as the dragon wanting to slay the male child. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. See we need to follow the sequence. This is very simple. I mean you don't have to guess about when the Antichrist is going to appear and what he's going to do because when you study the sequence, the historical flow, you know exactly where to look for the Antichrist. And so then you have in Daniel chapter 2 the legs of iron, that's the same as the period when the dragon wants to kill the child. And let me ask you, how many toes did the image have? It had ten toes, right? Now let me ask you, how many horns did the dragon have? It had ten horns. Are we running parallel here? We most certainly are. Now you remember that in, da in Daniel chapter 2 there were ten toes and they had iron which means that Rome continues but then there's an added element which was not there before and what is it? Clay. What does the clay represent? We studied it. It represents the church. A different kind of what? A different kind of Rome. Are you following me? Now would that be parallel to the 1260 years? Is that a continuation of Rome? Yes it is. Is it a period of amalgamation between church and state those 1260 years? Yes. So what we have during the 1260 years is parallel to the mixture of the iron and the clay. Now there's something that is not mentioned directly in Daniel chapter 2. You'll notice that the mixture of iron and clay lasts from the time that Rome is divided all the way till Jesus sets up his everlasting kingdom. Are you following me? But what Daniel chapter 2 doesn't tell you is what Revelation 12 does. And that is that this power that persecutes God's people is going to have two stages of existence. And we're going to study that in our lecture this evening. The first stage lasts how long? 1260 years. But is that the end of this power? That is not the end of this power. Because the Bible tells us that this power is going to last until when? Until Jesus comes. Which means that if it has a period of dominion of 1260 years, at some point after that its power must be what? Suspended. But in order to rule until Jesus comes, its power must be what? Its power must be restored and it must have a second period of dominion. 
Now on your understanding my point, this is a very important point. The feet of iron and clay in Daniel chapter 2 simply tell you that there's going to be a mixture of iron and clay until Jesus comes to set up His everlasting kingdom. It doesn't give you any impression that the feet of iron and clay is going to have two stages. But Revelation chapter 12 does give you that information. Because it says that this power that persecutes God's church is going to last for 1260 years and then it says that the earth helps the woman and after the earth helps the woman by stopping the persecution we're told that the dragon is enraged with the woman and goes to make war against her again. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. This is of critical importance. Now we need to go to Daniel chapter 7 which is one of the two chapters of study. We're also going to study Revelation 13 and verses 1 through 10. Daniel chapter 7. Now allow me to mention here the um, sequence that we find in Daniel chapter 7. First thing that I want us to notice is that, is that in this chapter we have four beasts. And according to Daniel 7 and verse 17 these four beasts represent four kings or kingdoms. It says there these great beasts which are four are four kings. And we've already studied that kings and kingdoms are what? Are interchangeable because there is no such thing as a king without a kingdom. In other words these four beasts represent four kingdoms. Now let me ask you, just perhaps do you think that maybe these four beasts represent the same thing as the four metals in Daniel chapter 2? What do you think? How many metals were there in Daniel chapter 2? Four. There was gold, silver, bronze, and iron. In Daniel chapter 7 we have four beasts. The four beasts represent four kingdoms. Do the four metals in Daniel chapter 2 represent four kingdoms? Absolutely. And so Daniel 7 is actually running parallel to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. Now we need to interpret some of the symbols here. It says there in Daniel chapter 7 that these beasts come forth from waters. From raging waters. Now what do waters represent in Scripture? Isaiah 17 and verses 12 and 13 tells us what waters represent. Let's go there for a moment. Isaiah chapter 17 and verses 12 and 13. Here we find uh, the following words. It says, Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. What do waters represent? They represent the tumult among what? Among nations. By the way it also says in Daniel chapter 7 verses 2 and 3 that the beasts arise in the, in the midst of the combating of the four winds of heaven. Now what do winds represent in scripture? Well let's turn in our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 13. There we find what the winds represent. Actually they represent strife or war. It says there, Behold, he shall come up like clouds, and his chariots like a what? Like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. In other words, the winds represent invading armies. They represent wars. The waters represent the tumult of nations. In other words, these four kingdoms arise in the midst of what? In the midst of war. Now you need to remember that because in our next lecture we're going to notice that there's another beast in Revelation 13. It does not arise from waters. There are no winds. It arises silently from the earth. That's the reason why I am mentioning this this evening because we need to understand that these four beasts actually arise in the midst of warfare. In fact if you read Daniel chapter 7 you'll discover that one beast devours the previous beast and rules. Then the next beast devours that one and the following beast devours that one. Just like in Daniel chapter 2 you have a sequence of nations. Now I'm just going to mention uh, very quickly the sequence 
of beasts in Daniel 7, so you have it clear in your mind. First of all you have a lion. What would the lion be equivalent to in Daniel 2? The head of what? Gold, Babylon. Secondly, you have a bear. What would the bear be equivalent to? The breast and arms of silver, the Medes and Persians. Then you have a leopard beast. What would the leopard beast be equivalent to? It would be equivalent to the belly of what? Of bronze. Then you have a terrible dragon beast that has iron teeth. Now I want you to notice that. A dragon beast that has iron teeth. Which kingdom in Daniel 2 would that be equivalent to? It would be equivalent to the legs of what? Of iron. Now you'll notice in Daniel 7 that it speaks about this dragon beast having ten what? Having ten horns. Is this running parallel to Daniel chapter 2? Is it running parallel to Revelation chapter 12? It most certainly is. And we're going to notice that Revelation 13 further amplifies this point. So I want you to notice that you have this fourth dragon beast who sprouts ten horns and then among the ten horns rises what? A little horn. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 7 and read verses 23 and 24. Daniel chapter 7 and verses 23 and 24. I want you to notice that this fourth beast has three stages of existence. Three stages of existence. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. Now notice this, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Let me ask you, does the kingdom exist before the ten horns arise from it? Does the kingdom rule for a period of time before it sprouts the horns? Yes. So Daniel 7 is explaining that in Revelation chapter 12 where it speaks about the dragon with ten horns, the ten horns were not there from the beginning, the ten horns came out after the dragon ruled for a period. Are you with me or not? Now let's notice what it continues saying in verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and now notice, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. So do you notice the sequence? How many stages does this dragon beast have? It has three stages of existence. One is as a simple dragon. Two, ten horns coming from the head of that simple dragon. And three, coming from among the ten, the little horn. Is this clear in your mind? Now if the fourth kingdom represents Rome, and the ten horns come from the head of the dragon beast, and the little horn comes from the head of the dragon beast, that must mean that all three of these stages are Roman stages. Are you understanding me? Now, let's go to examine then who this little horn represents. I want to review once again, it's important that we understand the sequence. We have a lion, Babylon, a bear, Medo-Persia, a leopard, Greece, a dragon, Rome. The dragon sprouts ten horns, the ten divisions of Rome, which is Western Europe today. Then among the ten horns, the little horn. By the way, the little horn would be equivalent to the clay in Daniel chapter 2, the added element that was not there before. Because Rome continues in the feet, because there's iron in the feet, but now there's something that's different. We're going to notice that the little horn is different than that, than that fourth beast, and different than the other horns. In other words, the, the clay is the same thing as the little horn. And by the way, in uh, Daniel chapter 7, you have the little horn. In Revelation chapter 12, you have what? the 1260 years of persecution of the woman. That would be equivalent to the clay and to the period of the little horn. Now, the question always comes up, who is this little horn? Who is the Antichrist? Well, 
Uh, there have been different ideas throughout the course of the last couple of hundred years. I remember people saying that Benito Mussolini would be the Antichrist. Not so. Others said that Adolf Hitler. Others said perhaps Henry Kissinger. I don't know whether you heard that, but I did hear that. Others said that the Ayatollah Khomeini, that nasty guy from Iran, you remember, that held our, our men hostage. Others more recently said that the Antichrist perhaps was Saddam Hussein. It seems like every time a nasty guy appears on the scene of history, he's a candidate in the minds of Christians for the Antichrist. Now my question is, do we need to determine the identity of Christ, uh, of Antichrist, by guesswork? I don't think so. Because the Bible gives us clearly the characteristics of the Antichrist. Now, let's notice, I'm going to share with you ten characteristics from Daniel chapter 7, and then I'm going to share with you two characteristics from Revelation chapter 13. And you're going to know who the Antichrist is. First characteristic, Daniel 7 and verse 24. Go with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24. We just read that verse, but let's read it again. It says, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. That is, from which kingdom? From the fourth kingdom, from Rome. And another shall rise after them. Where does the little horn rise from? From the head of what? From the head of the dragon beast. Everybody agreed? What does the dragon beast represent? Rome. So is this horn Roman? Or is it perhaps Syria? Can't be. Because the fourth beast is not Syria. The fourth beast is Rome. So if the little horn comes from the fourth beast, and the fourth beast is Rome, this little horn must be Roman. It must be one of the stages of Rome. Not the united empire of Rome, not the Rome that was divided into ten kingdoms, but a Rome that came up after the ten kingdoms came up. Now, first characteristic then, it must be a Roman power. Second characteristic, it must arise after the ten horns are in place. Did you notice that in verse 24? It says that after the ten horns will arise this horn. So let me ask you, are the ten horns in place when the little horn rises? Of course. Now when were the ten horns in place? You can read the document that I referred to you, you to, uh, that you can download at secretsunsealed.org, and I have an abundance of information there on how the ten kingdoms were all established in the year 476 AD when the last Roman emperor Romulus Augustulus was deposed from his throne. There were no emperors after him. The kingdom had been divided by the barbarian tribes that invaded from the north. So we must expect that the Antichrist will rise from Rome, it will be Roman, and it will arise after what date? It will rise after the year, what? After the year 476, which is when the ten horns are complete. Now let's go to our third characteristic. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. Here we find another interesting and important characteristic of this little horn. It says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. Where did the little horn come up? Among what? When it says them, what is it referring to? Among the ten. Now where were the ten located geographically? It was in Western Europe. Was Rome divided into ten kingdoms? Absolutely. Was that the territory of what had been Rome? Obviously yes. And so the little horn was going to arise among the divisions of Western Europe. Of course you're saying, if it's a Roman power, he must be in Western Europe. But this is an added emphasis to exclamation point to the idea that this power is Roman. Because first of all it comes from the head of the fourth beast which represents Rome and secondly it comes among the ten which are the divisions of the Roman Empire. 
So we have three characteristics so far. Number one, it must be Roman. Number two, it must rise after the year 476. Number three, it must arise in Western Europe because it rises after the ten horns are there. Characteristic number four. Notice Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8 once again. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. Here we find another interesting characteristic. It says there in verse 8, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. What did this horn do when it rose to power? it uprooted three of the ten horns. So you must find in history of Western Europe some power which uprooted three of the ten barbarian kingdoms which established their nations there in Western Europe. You must have a power that uprooted three of the ten horns in Western Europe. Characteristic number five Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 has our fifth characteristic and it says there uh, in Daniel 7 and verse 25 and there are several characteristics actually in this verse that we're going to come to but it says there he shall speak pompous words against the Most High now Revelation 13 that we're coming to a little bit later on says that the pompous words are what? Blasphemies. In other words this power would speak blasphemies against the Most High. The pompous words or the great words are blasphemies. Now what is blasphemy? Well there are two key texts in the New Testament which describe blasphemy. There are others but two key ones in relationship to what we're studying. The first is in Mark chapter 2 and verse 7 where remember Jesus said to the paralytic your sins are forgiven. Did Jesus have the right to forgive sins? Why? Because he was God, right? But what did those who were present there say about him? They said this man speaks what? Blasphemy! Who can forgive sins but only God? So let me ask you, if a man claims to have power to forgive sins and he's not God, what is that? That is blasphemy. The other important text is in John chapter 10 verses 30 to 33 where Jesus says I and the Father are one and they picked up stones to stone Jesus and Jesus says why are you going to stone me? What bad deed I have done? Have I done? And they say it's not for any good deed that we're going to stone you but for blasphemy because you being a man have made yourself God. So blasphemy is when a mere man claims to have the power to forgive sins and claims to be God on earth. Those are the pompous words of the little horn. Are you starting to catch an interesting picture here? We're letting the Bible interpret who this power is. It's not some nasty individual who's going to rise in the Middle East sometime in the future. The devil wants people to think that. Because meanwhile the Antichrist grows in Rome and nobody notices it because they're looking in the wrong place. Hello? Do you think the devil would want Christians to look for the Antichrist in the wrong place, at the wrong time, the wrong person? Obviously yes, because the devil can do whatever he pleases. Now the sixth characteristic, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24 says something very interesting about this little horn. Daniel 7 and verse 24. It says here, the ten horns are ten kings that shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them he shall be what? different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Is this little horn different than the other ten? Yes or no? Absolutely. Was the clay in the feet different than all of the metals that came before it? Absolutely. So this kingdom's going to be different because it's not only going to be a kingdom like iron of Rome, but it's going to be an amalgamated kingdom. It's going to be a blended or mixed kingdom. A kingdom that blends or mixes what? Church and state. So 
So we're supposed to look for a power that is different. It's not a mere political power like all of the rest of the kingdoms. It is a different type of kingdom. Just like the mixture of iron and clay is a different type of kingdom. Because all of the others were metals, whereas the feet are a combination of metal and clay. And so number six is that this power has to be different. Characteristic number seven. Notice Daniel chapter 7 and verse 21. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 21. Here we find uh, in this verse as well as in verse 25 the same idea. It says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. What did this horn do? He persecuted whom? He persecuted the saints. Notice verse 25. It says in verse 25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Was this little horn going to be a persecuting power against the saints? Absolutely. By the way, do you know what it means by, by saints here? It's the same as the woman who fled to the wilderness. What does a woman represent in prophecy? It represents the church. So when it says that he persecuted the saints, what is it talking about? It says that he persecuted what? the church. So let me ask you, was the established church in the Middle Ages the true church? You want to know what the true church was in the Middle Ages? All you have to do is see which church persecuted and which, perse which church was, was the persecutor. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There were two churches during this period. There was the established church who persecuted the saints or the woman and there was a true church which is represented by the woman. You say, how is this possible? Do you know that all throughout human history the greatest enemies of God's people have been others who claim to be God's people? It began with Cain and Abel. Cain claimed to serve the true God. He healed his brother. In the Old Testament those who hated the prophets were the very nation that they were sent to. People who claimed to serve God. Jesus Christ was crucified by those who claimed to serve God. And during the Middle Ages, God's people, God's true people, were persecuted by a church that claimed to be on God's side. And Jesus says in the end time, in John chapter 16, He says, the time is coming when those who persecute you will think that they're doing God a favor. So there's nothing new under the sun. In other words, this power would be a church that would persecute God's true people and we're going to notice that it was during a specific period of time. Now let's go back to Daniel 7 verse 25 for characteristic number 8. Daniel 7 and verse 25 characteristic number 8. It says here, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times. Let's stop there and shall intend to change what? Times. Now say, what does that mean to change times? I'm going to explain it very quickly. We don't have time to read the verses. You have them in your list. Acts 1 verse 7, Jesus says it's not for you no, to know the times or the seasons that God has placed under His own power. By the way, He's talking about prophetic events, isn't He? It's not for you to know the sequence of prophetic events. God has those in secret. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1, he says regarding the times and the seasons, I don't need to talk to you about that. And then he begins talking about the prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus. And so the word times in Scripture, when it's, when it's in a prophetic context, is referring to events that are in God's prophetic calendar. God's prophetic calendar of events. In other words, how history is going to develop. By the way, do you know that after Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar did not like what he saw? Do you know he tried to change God's times? Because God said there's going to be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome is going to be divided in, in ten, and then among those ten is going to rise a little horn, then God's going to set up His everlasting kingdom, and, and Nebuchadnezzar, by the way that's Daniel 7, but Daniel 2 is the same idea. Nebuchadnezzar says that's not the way it's going to be. And so what he did in Daniel 3 was raise up an image all of gold. He's saying history is not going to flow that way, it's going to flow the way I say. He was trying to change the order of prophetic events that God had established. So what would this little horn try to do? He would try to change God's 
prophetic calendar of events. In other words he would point people to the wrong place, the wrong time, and the wrong powers as fulfillments of Bible prophecy. By the way I did a series here a while back uh, specifically on the changing of the times. A whole one hour lecture on everything that the Bible says about changing the times. This little horn in other words what thought that it could change God, God's sequence of events, the fulfillment of prophecy as God had indicated that it was going to be fulfilled. Now what else would this little horn think about changing? It says there in Daniel 7 verse 25 He shall think to change times and what? And the law he was all even going to, to, in, uh, to intend or to attempt to change what? God's holy law. Not only God's prophetic calendar, but he was going to stick his hand in God's law and attempt in some way to change the law. Notice it doesn't say that he was going to abolish the law, it says he was going to try to change it. And then I want you to notice the tenth characteristic, and we're going to review them in a minute in case you lost track of the number. Notice once again Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. How long was this power going to rule? Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. It says here, Daniel 7 and verse 25, the following, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, he shall intend to change times and law, then and it says the saints, you note that that's in italics, the saints shall be given into his hand for how long? For a time and times and half a time. Is this the same time period that the woman fled to the wilderness in Revelation 12? Or is this the same sequence? You're not with me tonight are you? Yes. Is this an orderly, orderly way of studying Bible prophecy? I mean this is not guesswork. When you follow the historical flow method you know exactly where you are at each moment in the flow of history. It's that simple. You don't have to guess because it jumps out at you when you know that you're going to have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome was going to be divided into ten kingdoms, 476, and then shortly thereafter a little horn was going to arise which fulfills all of these specifications. Now what are the ten characteristics? Quickly. Number one, it must be Roman. Number two, it must rise after the ten horns. Number three, it must arise among the ten horns. That is in Western Europe. Number four, it must pluck out three of the ten horns. Number five, it must speak blasphemy against God. It must claim to be God on earth and it must claim to have the power to forgive sins. In other words, number six, it must be different than the other kingdoms. Number seven, it must be a persecutor of God's people. Number eight, it must have sought to change God's order of prophetic events. Number nine, it thought that it could change the law of God. And number ten, it ruled for time, times, and the dividing of time. How many of you think that you know what power this is? Do you really have to guess if you know history? Now, we need to take a look at Revelation 13 because this completes the picture. We have two more characteristics that I want to underline in Revelation 13. Let's go to Revelation 13 verses 1 and 2. Revelation 13 and verses 1 and 2. And you're going to tell me if this has any connection with Daniel, or whether I'm guessing. By the way, who is the power behind uh, all of these kingdoms in Daniel chapter 7? Who's really behind the little horn? I mean, do you have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that in Revelation chapter 12 it's the dragon, the ancient serpent that goes after the woman? And in Daniel 7 it says that the little horn is the one that goes after the saints. Do you have to really be that intelligent to know that the little horn is really the emissary of Satan? You're not following me. See? Revelation 12 gives you the background. Who's behind the scenes? Whereas Daniel chapter 7 talks about the upfront guy. The power that the devil uses to persecute the saints of the Most High. Revelation 13 verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now notice verse 2, critical verse. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. 
What does that scream at you? Go back to Daniel 7! By the way, do you notice the order of the powers here? In Daniel 7 it is lion, bear, leopard, dragon. In Revelation 13 it's dragon, leopard, bear, lion. Do you know why? Because Daniel is living in the period of the lion and he's looking forwards whereas John is living in the period of the dragon and he's looking backwards. Are you understanding my point? Now notice it says there's four beasts here. It says in verse 2, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of the lion, and the dragon. There you have the fourth beast. The dragon, by the way how many horns does that dragon have? It's the same one of Revelation 12, it has ten horns. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and what? And great authority. So you have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, and beast. In the prophecy of Daniel 7 you have lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, and what? And what? And little horn. Are these prophecies running parallel? Yes they are. So is the little horn the same as the beast? Uh, lest any of you don't still believe that, allow me to read you some characteristics of this beast. Notice Revelation 13 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7, speaking about the beast, it says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Is that the same thing as the little horn did? Yes. Now let's notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 6. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 6. It says, then he opened his mouth in oh by the way look at this, then he opened his mouth and what? Did the little horn do that? Yes, opened up his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. I wish I had time to speak about each one of those phrases. Each one of those phrases deserves 15 minutes at least. And now notice how long does this power rule? Notice verse 5. It says, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now isn't this interesting? How long is 42 months? Well the biblical month has 30 days. Let's do the operation. 42 months times 30 days each, how much is that? 1260. Does that sound familiar? Is this the same period as the time, times, and dividing of time of the little horn? Is it the same period of, of the 1260 days that the woman flees into the wilderness? Yes, these prophecies are all parallel. And Revelation 12 shows that the devil is the power behind all of these. Now we need to take a look at the last two characteristics. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Do you remember that the clay continues until the second coming of Jesus? The iron and clay mixture is the last power until Jesus comes. In Daniel chapter 7, I want you to notice this, in Daniel chapter 7 it says that the little horn rules for time, times, and the dividing of time, but then Daniel 7 explains that the little horn, its dominion will be taken away when Jesus comes. So implicitly in Daniel chapter 7 what it's saying is that this little horn is, governed, is going to govern for 1260 years, time, times, and the dividing of time, and then somehow after this period of dominion it is going to rule what? Again, because if it's, if, it, if it's dominion is taken away when Jesus comes, it must rise to power again. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. So how many stages is this little horn or this beast power going to have? It's going to have actually three stages. We already, already noticed actually it has two. The first is the 1260 years and the second is what? when it recovers its power. Now let's notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. Here we find a very interesting characteristic of this beast. It says there, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. Would you say that that took place uh, when, it, uh, when the 1260 years came to an end? Of course. That's what cuts, sh cuts its career short of the second coming at the end of 1260 years. And so it says, 
And his deadly wound was what? Was he, is he going to have another power of dominion? Is he going to rule until Jesus comes? Absolutely! It says his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the what? And followed the beast. How many stages is this power going to have? It's going to have two stages. One of the stages is already what? Past. The other stage is still future. Now I want you to notice Revelation chapter 13 and verses 9 and 10. What was it that wounded this power? Because he received a deadly wound. How was he wounded? Revelation 13 and verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. How was this power killed? How did it receive its deadly wound? With the sword. Is that clear? Now, what does the sword represent? Yes, the sword represents the Word of God, but not in this particular verse. Who bears the sword according to the Apostle Paul? We don't have time to look up the text, but in Romans chapter 13 it says that the government has the what? The government has the power of the sword. And God said it's for your good. And if you misbehave and you don't obey the civil magistrates, He will use the what? He will use the sword. So the sword represents the civil power. I don't know whether you're following me or not. Which must mean that at the end of the 1260 years, the civil power was going to rise to give this religious power a deadly wound. Are you with me or not? And so that's another characteristic. It has to be a power that after the 1260 years was wounded by the civil power, but this power is going to recuperate its worldwide clout. Final characteristic, and then we'll quickly identify this power. I think that you already know who it is. What is the number of this power? Go with me to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. It says here, here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, his number is 666. What is the number of the beast? 666. Now how do you determine the number of a man? That's kind of hard. Well, let's go to verse 17, it explains how you do it. It says, and that no man may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. How do you determine the number of the beast? It's the number of his what? Of his name. In other words, his name must give the total what? 666. Are you understanding? He has a name whose numeric value is 666, because in antiquity they wrote numbers with letters. Each letter of the alphabet stood for a number. Now let me ask you, what language do you suppose we should use to try and find this name? What language do you think we should use? English, right? No, how about German? Will anybody give me Japanese? What language must we use to determine the name and get the number from the name. It has to be Latin. Because this is a Roman power. It has to be a Latin name whose numerical value is 666. And by the way, Revelation 13 verse 1 says that it must be a blasphemous name. Now let's put it all together. What would be the name of this power and that name, when you calculate the value of the letters in Latin, gives the number 666. Well, we're going to take a look at that. We have about seven minutes now to go through all of these characteristics and see who this power is. Anybody care to tell me who this power is? You're all shy. Camera shy. There's no doubt whatsoever, folks, that this power is the Roman Catholic Papacy. 
Let me tell you why. Is the Roman Catholic Papacy Roman? It's called the Roman Catholic Church. What is its language? Latin. Where is the seat of its power? Rome. The name of its leader is Pontifex Maximus. In Latin, the Supreme Pontiff. Its religion is from ancient Rome. Its organizational style is from Rome. I could take time to prove all of these points. In other words, it is Roman. Let me ask you, did the Roman Catholic Papacy arise after the Ten Horns were in place? If you read that document you'll find that it rose to power in 538 when Justinian the Emperor said the Pope is now Lord in East and in West of the entire church. The Emperor, Emperor Justinian proclaimed that. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy arise in Western Europe? Because if it rises in Rome obviously that is Western Europe. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy uproot three of those kingdoms? It's a long story. There were three rebellious kingdoms that were Arians. They taught that Jesus Christ was a created being. And the Pope says we need to get rid of these. 493, through the help of the Empire, they got rid of the Heruli. In the year 534 they got rid of the Vandals. And in the year 538 they got rid of the Ostrogoths. Three of these ten kingdoms were uprooted and today there is no nation in Europe that descends from these three powers. They were taken out by the roots. This can be proven historically that the church used the empire to do this. Does the Roman Catholic Papacy claim that the Pope is God's representative on earth? I could read you statement after statement, page after page from this document that I wrote from Roman Catholic sources. Does the Roman Catholic Papacy claim to have the power to forgive sins? Yes, they have the confessional in their churches. The very ca characteristics of blasphemy. Is the Roman Catholic Papacy different than any of these other kingdoms? Yes it is. Because the Roman Catholic Church, you don't know whether it's a church or whether it's a state. It is a state, but it's a church. And when the United States was going to establish diplomatic relations, there was all sorts of confusion in Congress. How can you have diplomatic relations with a church? And the argument was, well you're not having it with the church part, you're having it with the state part. As if you could separate the two. You say you have a mixture of iron and clay. You have a mixture of church and state. The papacy was certainly different. Did the Roman Catholic papacy persecute God's people? It's calculated that at least 50 million of God's people were killed during the 1260 years of apostasy. Did the Roman Catholic Church seek to change God's prophetic interpretation of, of events, of prophetic events? It would take me far longer than we have to talk about this. They actually invented two rival systems of prophetic interpretations. One known as Preterism, the idea that all of the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled in the past in the Roman Empire and with a nasty individual called Antiochus Epiphanes, way in the past. And the other futurist scenario, established by a Jesuit priest called Ribera, his idea was the Antichrist prophecies are going to be fulfilled at the very end of time with a nasty individual who's going to arise and persecute the Jews after the church has been raptured to heaven. And that's what Protestants believe today. It was created in the Roman Catholic Church. Two rival systems of interpreting Bible prophecy. Did the Roman Catholic Church claim to have the power to change God's law? If I had the time I would read you, I have 16 pages of statements from Roman Catholic writers saying we, by the authority that God gave the church, changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. They unabashedly say it, time after time after time in their publications. They claim to change God's law. And if you go to the Roman Catholic Catechism, you'll discover that the Roman Catholic Catechisms eliminate the second commandment that forbids the worship of images and they have to end up with ten so they divide the tenth commandment in two. Did the Roman Catholic Papacy govern for 1260 years? Yes. When Justinian, de Justinian's decree was implemented in the year 538, that was the beginning. And lo and behold, in February, February 10 of 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte entered Vatican City and through his general Berthier the Pope was arrested and he was taken captive like it says. He who leads into captivity will be taken into captivity. And the civil power of France arose against the papacy and withdrew its power. And the Roman Catholic Church has not been the same since 
but it is slowly recovering its power if you're able to see what's happening in the world today is the Roman Catholic Papacy does it have a lot more prestige now than it used to? it most certainly does I mean the Pope sneezes and the media dedicates all of their news shows just to that because this power has tremendous prestige but the Bible calls it the Antichrist, now understand me I'm not saying that everybody in the Roman Catholic system is bad most of God's true people are there believe it or not that's why God says come out of her my people God must have people there in Babylon in order for him to call them out and finally folks not only was the papacy wounded and its deadly wound is in the process of healing see it's going to dominate the world again the whole world is going to follow this system even Protestants but also the Pope has a name by the way it will be in the DVD presentation the name is Vicarious Philly Day which means vicar or substitute for the Son of God that name was on the papal crown until the 17th century but it was removed for obvious reasons the name if you count the number of the letters in the Latin numeral system is 666 there's no doubt who this power is it's the Roman Catholic Papacy and we must flee from this power we must never fall into its hands